1965 that a provision was made for the separated brethren. Oh, I like that. I used to tease my classmates. I'm so happy. I'm not a heretic anymore. I'm a separated brother. And how can we be separated in Jesus Christ, you know? It was at Vatican II that the provision was made for the first time to allow the separated brethren to study in Pontifical University in Rome. There are five of them. I was the first one to take advantage of it. And the last one as well. You will, hear, you will learn about it in a moment why. And <laughs> They interviewed me for two solid hours. They wanted to find out if perchance I was an Adventist spy entering there to do subversive activities. It's amazing that I had been uh, labeled as a spy both outside and inside the church. Even in, in the Adventist church, there are those who have been circulating. Even uh, last week, I got a 12-page um, publication where they are trying to construct a case against me, making me into a Jesuit spy paid by the Vatican to do subversive activity in the Adventist church. I wish that these people, before writing out all of this nonsense, would take time to talk to me or even to read what I have written. Then they would see that they are wasting their time because I'm a deeply committed Seventh-day Adventist. I pay the high price throughout my life to stand up for the truth that we cherish. All of these accusations, they are fabricated by people that have a conspiracy mentality, you know. Finally, they admitted me on one condition. What was it? They told me that while I was there in the classrooms, in the hallway, I should do no proselytism. I was supposed to keep my mouth shut, which is not easy for an Italian to do, by the way. <laughs> but you know what happened? I was there as a lay person. I was not wearing a monastic robe or a priestly robe. So I was an object of curiosity. They always ask me, to which religious order do you belong? Because all of them belong to various monastic orders. And jokingly, I would say, I belong to a special order, the Adventist order. And they would scratch their head, which monastic order is that? <laughs> that gave me a marvelous opportunity for me to share my faith. Even in the classroom. You know what I remember? I remember my beloved professor, uh, Vincenzo Monachin, often at the end of his lecture would ask me the question, Samuel, how do you Adventists understand this particular you know, teaching or dogma that we were uh, studying in the class? And I was always very happy to give an answer because I was only supposed to speak if I was interrogated. Whenever he asked me a question, I said, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now I can speak. I remember the day. Careful now. I remember the day. We were, when we were discussing in the class the Vatican plan to anticipate the first Sunday mass to Saturday afternoon, which has been implemented, by the way, everywhere around the world today, Catholic can fulfill what is known as the mass precept by going to church on Saturday afternoon. Are you aware of that? Everywhere you go today, Catholic who cannot make it to church on Sunday can go to church on Saturday afternoon or Saturday evening, attend the Saturday mass, and that will be good enough for uh, fulfilling their Sunday uh, mass precept. And my professor asked, Samuele, how do you Adventists feel about it? You must be ecstatic about the fact that we Catholics are becoming more and more like you Adventists by observing the tail end of the Sabbath. So, Professor, thank you for asking. I could only speak if I was interrogated. Thank you for asking. But you know what? The Saturday afternoon mass may be good enough for Sunday keeping, but not for Sabbath keeping. Why? Because I said the essence of Sabbath keeping is not just going to church. The Sabbath commandment doesn't say, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy by attending Sabbath school and divine service. It doesn't say that. That the essence of Sabbath keeping is giving priority to God in our thinking and in our living. And for us as Seventh-day Adventists, all what we do on the Sabbath, whether we participate in a corporate worship experience or whether we enjoy formal fellowship, you know, visitation, recreation, all of it for us is an act of worship because it springs out of a heart who has decided to honor God on his holy day. Mamma mia, he should have seen my classmates and my professor. They were looking at 
that means? Do you mean to say that all the Adventists give priority to God on the Sabbath, consecrate their Sabbath time to God? Well, I said, I cannot speak for everybody. In every church, there are those who don't practice what they profess. But this is the way we understand the Sabbath. Isn't it true? Oh, what a pleasure it was to be there and share the faith among so many 5,000 students coming from 91 different countries. Now, this leads me to the subject of my research. How did I become involved in this um, investigation of the origin of Sunday? One morning I got there early, 7 o'clock. Start, classes started at 9 o'clock. The only way to find a parking spot was to be there two hours before class. I tell you, you don't realize how privileged we are in a place like Andrew, that we can park the car without having to lose our mind, you know. And we only had a small parking lot, 450 cars. We were 5,000 coming from all over the city. And so since I had some time on my hand, I went, I spent the time in the hallway looking at all the latest publication which had just been released by the university. And I saw a newly published dissertation the title of the dissertation is Storia della Domenica, History of Sunday from the beginning to the fourth century. This is a very major dissertation style. I went to the bookstore, I purchased a copy right away, and for the next several months, I used every spare moment to examine this book. In fact, shall I tell you, tell you one thing? I was going to bring you my own personal copy, but it is so worn out that I thought it would be embarrassing to show it to you. So I went to the library to get a copy that looks a bit cleaner, as you can see. But I spent many months examining this book. And what I was surprised me is that this Jesuit scholars argues that the Sabbath was changed to Sunday by the authority of Christ, by the authority of the apostle, who he claims chose the first day of the week, Sunday, in order to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus by means of the Lord's Supper celebration. Now, this is a very popular view. I'm sure that you have heard this view before, that Sunday was uh, instituted, you know, originated as a memorial of the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, um, this, however, I should explain, is not the historical traditional Catholic view. This is a new explanation. Historically, the Catholic Church has always claimed the responsibility for changing the Sabbath to Sunday. For example, Thomas Aquinas, who is regarded as the most influential, authoritative Catholic theologian, he is to the Catholic Church what Ellen White is to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Notice what he says. In the new law, the observance of the Lord's Day took the place of the observance of the Sabbath not by virtue of the Sabbath commandment, but by the institution of the church. Do you remember reading in the older Catholic catechism where the question is asked, why do we observe Sunday rather than Saturday? What has been the historical answer? We observe Sunday rather than Saturday because the Roman Catholic Church, by virtue of their authority, has transferred the solemnity of the Sabbath to Sunday. Have you heard that before? Well, that was the historical, traditional explanation. We, the Catholic Church, did it. Today, however, there is a new attempt to legitimize Sunday no longer as a Catholic ecclesiastical institution, but as a biblical institution. And this is why you need to come to listen to the fourth lecture, The Sabbath and the Crossfire, because in that lecture, I'm going to spend some time examining the famous pastoral letter of Pope John Paul II, Dies Domini, the Lord's Day, where you will see how the Pope attempts to make Sunday the biblical Sabbath and promote Sunday no longer as a Catholic, but as a biblical institution. And this, in many ways, is the approach of Catholic and Protestant scholars and even of former Sabbatarian. When I discovered this trend, when I noticed how this trend of trying to legitimize Sunday as a biblical institution, as I read all of this dissertation, I spent over $1,000 ordering a dissertation from Germany, from Spain, from Switzerland, from the United States. I ordered a dissertation by Francis Regan, then at the Catholic University of America. For that dissertation alone, I paid $150 to have a photocopy, and they're mailed to me in Rome. As I read all of this research, and I noticed this, this 
concerted effort, this stretching of the hands across the gulf in their common endeavor to justify Sandy as a biblical institution, I ask myself, is it possible that the Lord has brought me here at such a time as this? You know, to undertake a research conducted with scientific rigor and methodology, a research that can help to clarify the time, the place, the causes, the consequences of the change of God's holiday. You know, folks, the more I thought about it, the more